We'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. As usual, my name is John Hines. I preach for the North Ridgeville Church of Christ, just southwest of Cleveland. My co-host, as usual, hello, Daniel. Hello, I'm Daniel Sanders, preach for the Norwalk Church of Christ, located halfway between Toledo and Cleveland, up in the northern central part of Ohio, just about 15 minutes south of Cedar Point. You always have to plug it. Yeah, I do. Still going on. Are you sponsored? Do they sponsor you? I was just there on Saturday. They gave me some. They gave me some free merchandise this time to be able to sponsor. Continue with the sponsorship. Just for passing the business on to them. Yeah. Ay ay ay. How do you get a sponsorship? I don't know, but we'll have some people coming here soon that'll be visiting us a couple weeks coming from Cedar Point. I don't know who would sponsor me where I am, but anyway, this week we also have. Uh, we have a special guest with us. We have Terry Sanders. How are you doing, Hello. Terry? I'm good. Good. Uh, Terry's obviously Dan- Daniel's father, for those of you who know the family. And, oh, we've, Terry, you and I, we've kind of followed each other a little bit there for, yeah. there for some, there for some time. You were down in, down in Tuckerman, Arkansas. Right. And that's, and I preached, my first full time preaching place was BB, Arkansas. Just down the road from Tuckerman. Just down the road. And I I remember, I was trying to remember, did you all support me on a one-time basis or a regular basis? I, I couldn't I, remember. It's, actually, it's been 13 yeah. to 15 years ago. We couldn't do it on a monthly basis. But a one-time. But we had money for gospel meetings and we had you come for a gospel meeting. And I remember that was the worst gospel meeting. It was my first gospel meeting, but I was such a blowhard back then. You probably probably should have smacked me around a little bit back then, but I thought was, you did fine. Uh, that that was my first gospel meeting ever, and I was just just a little bit of a blowhard. Probably some a lot of people probably think I'm still a blowhard, but yeah, actually, but I, I appreciated I appreciated that and look back look back on that fondly. Actually, all three of us in common go back to Indiana days, right? And the lectureships in Indianapolis and. We'd come to visit, and you all, your folks and family and everything would all be there. So uh, we've got a long, uh, meandering history. Yeah. What a long, strange trip it's been <laughs> Yeah, and, to get us here. And I mean, and the, the threads just go in and out. And, yeah. and because where I, where I am right now, here in North Ridgeville, this is where you preached back uh, from late. 2012 to... 2019 yeah in there in in that um those so you're here for six six years six years yeah yeah and so it's a small world yes it is so anyway so we we appreciate you being on the program with us up here visiting visiting with family and you agreed i don't know why you i don't know why you agree why did you agree to this i just dragged him along (laughs) i i could put in a plug i i actually retired from preaching i had health issues and Got yeah. those cleared up, and now I'm preaching for the church in Piggott, Arkansas, and uh, in the mornings, and then I preach in the evenings at Oak Grove. They're in the northeast corner of Arkansas, up there, tucked in underneath the boot heel. Yeah, if you know where that's at. And if you've never lived in Arkansas, you you need to visit the state just to go around, and all of the names of the towns are just <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, they are just wonderful. Piggott. And uh, Goobertown. Huh? Goobertown. 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 When there is Sharoom. Seems Probably. like there's a Sharoom. Yeah. We live. Possum Grape. <laughs> Possum, Possum Grape. Possum Grape. We had, we, we had brethren there in BB who were from Romance. Uh, I was thought it would be interesting to live in Romance. Yeah, and, and then down on the river by, uh, I can't remember where it's at. It's north of, uh, north of Little Rock. There's Toad Suck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can't forget that. <laughs> so hard to forget. That. Anyway, if if you've ever been in Arkansas or had a chance to visit, it's 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 a, a good place to good place to be. So, Daniel, we have been speaking about. Uh, let's see, what have we been talking about? The different ways the Lord's people are are described. Different different names. Yeah, and let's see. I actually wrote it down this you week. Wrote it I was, down? I was okay. doing pretty good. I said, so, trying to tell him what let's see, we we're going over, and I said I'm missing one of them. Okay, so this is what this is the road so far. We've spoken about how we are described as the Lord's sheep. We are described as members, being members of the body. We talked about what that entails. Citizens of the kingdom. We've talked about we are described as saints, sanctified, holy. 
And we've spoken about last week, we talked about how we're described as disciples. And I think that's probably the most, um, the one that's used the most often Yeah, would be disciples. Mm -hmm. So we talked about that and discipleship and discipline and things along those lines. So I thought this week we might talk about how the church is described as the bride, the bride of Christ. And it actually shows up a couple places, um, more than a couple places, but one of them is in Revelation, you know, where the Apostle John is there and the angel says, let me show you, let me show you the bride, uh, the lamb's, the lamb's wife. And, and so you have that picture there in Revelation as the new Jerusalem comes down and and we'll go back to Revelation, I think, at the tail end, because the bride is mentioned once again. But I think one of the places where it speaks about this figure, and bride is, as we're described as the bride, that it's a little bit different in that I think so far, when you say, Daniel, we've spoken about how we're described individually. Yes. Yeah, and this and this one is we're looking at is more more collective. The the collective yeah. as as the whole with everything. Yeah. As we consider these different things, because again, we talk about the idea of being a saint. Then right. we talk about the individuality of that, a citizen, individuality. The sheep, I think we could maybe say that that's similar to what we're going to be talking about today of a, of a group. Yeah, just I think a, I think a sheep is one that really can focus on both sides of it. Yeah, and then as we look, members was members was definitely Very individually. Much individual. Yeah, and then we are looking and talking about that as yeah. a whole together there in First yeah. Corinthians twelve. Yeah, so. So this one's a little bit different because we are looking at at church in in total, I guess, but being the bride. So I thought we might just look in Ephesians and just make a a few, just a few simple points. And I always have to ask, so I'm New King James. You read out of the New King James, right, Daniel? Yeah. Terry, I can't remember what you are. That's what I got. You're a New King James. Okay. Yeah. So we're all on the same page. Amen, Kudos kudos to us. (laughs) It's almost like we prearranged that. <laughs> but anyway, let's... Did you want me to read something different? I can. No. Okay. <laughs> not <laughs> not yet access. anyway. <laughs> not yet anyway. So anyway, let's let's read together some in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll start in verse... Um, verse Actually, verse 21 talks about submission, that we're sub- supposed to be submitting to one another in the fear of God. And then... The idea of submission carries on. Verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You know, and it always floors me. We we usually talk about that verse in the context, and people usually, oh, that's the marriage passage, and talking about husbands and wives. And, and while there is an application there, you can tell it's not... That's, that's sort focus. of secondary right. <laughs> that Paul says, I'm actually talking about Christ and his church. Yeah. That's, yeah, right. And of course, our marriages should be a, a reflection of that. But here is we, we think about the bride and, and to just go through the passage. I thought we might start by talking about talking about headship there. So as we have for as the husband is the head of the wife, <clears throat> so also Christ is head of the church. Okay. Take it away, fellas. There's two of you now. Headship. What do we want? What do we want to talk about? Oh, avoiding. Uh, you don't want to be the first one to say anything. I see how this works today. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I thought that's how it worked every day. <laughs> um, but I, I was just thinking about leadership. Yeah. And and authority and and things some along look, those those lines. Some look at this and you know we'll try to say well that, that you know trying to put someone above or over top of someone well. In a way, yes, but not in the way that we're trying to think about it. Christ is head of the church. 
We are the we are the body of the church. We are in subjection to the head. The head, the headship. You know, as I look at this, is to nourish, is to cherish, is to love. Is what Paul is mentioning here. Being able to look out for these things, and as Jesus pointed out in Matthew sixteen verse eighteen, he says, "You know, upon this rock I will build my church." So he's putting ownership on his church as well, which gets into the next point in just, in just a little bit, but being able to take care of things, there's the headship of everything, being able to look out for things. And again, we are in subjection to that. Uh, it's not trying to put, you know, one over top of the other in, in the way that the world may think, but it is in a way of showing that, uh, respect, that fear, that, that awe to our God and creator and doing it through his son, Jesus Christ. And I mean, 1 Corinthians 11, you know, starts by talking about headship. And it's not as though Christ does not have a head also. You know, as it talks about the head of man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. Yeah. So it's not like when Jesus came, when he emptied himself <laughs> and he subjected himself, did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God, Philippians, but made himself of no reputation. And, and so as as Christ is the head of the church, we look forward to the time when he turns the kingdom back to God. And and you have that picture of subjection as well. But but just the idea of of headship and I don't know how y'all are, but do you do you feel like sometimes husbands present company excluded <laughs> that that they can act like dictators. Oh sure. And it's like that that's not yeah. while there is a respect of authority, but at the same time you look at how Jesus uses that authority. And and there may be times where it's like, okay, he has to he has to insist and assert on that authority because he is the head. But but to just look at this idea of leadership, and it's like, okay. And let me just ask the question, and, and Terry, I'll ask you. Do you feel like, because you do have this figure of marriage, right? Do, do you feel like in a lot of marriages, the leadership that Christ has with his church is not manifested in a lot of marriages between husbands and wives and families? Yeah. Namely, do you, do you see a lot of husbands being the head of the family like they need to? I guess is really my question. Well, I, there was... I'm old enough now to realize that there was a time when there might have been more of that than there is now. I think historically, you can even go back to the Old Testament, there's always been a problem with being in subjection or submission voluntarily. That's how Israel was supposed to be. And where they always got in trouble was whenever their head, the one they were supposed to reverence, the one they were supposed to worship, God, they rejected him. That was always their problem over and over and over again. And that's the problem in, in marriages a lot of times. And we see it today. As a matter of fact, there's been calls for, for women, wives, to be rebellious to their husbands. I can't think of a better word for it. And that's created problems. And yeah, no matter how you want to look at this, a lot of times the problems that go on in the world eventually they filter into the church and pretty soon you got the church that's not wanting to be in subjection to the head, which is Christ. And we're supposed to do this readily, readily. Instead, we find so many doing this rebelliously. They don't want to do that. And there's no place in here in the passages we've read. I've had, I've had people tell me, I think those passages in there that the, that the woman's given a secondary place or something like that. They almost make it sound like what you said, dictator, almost like it's a master servant thing. Yeah, It's not that way. It's supposed to be a mutual understanding on this. You know, it's not somebody running around a little tin, tin hat, you know, like a dictator, like you mentioned a few moments ago, that you're supposed to be working together on this. But in the end, I don't care what situation you're talking about. In the end, there's one person that eventually is going to have to make the call. Yeah. Whether it's Jesus, God, or the husband, or back in the Old Testament, who made the call most of the time. Didn't Moses make the call most of the time in the Old Testament? Weren't the judges supposed to make the call? 
There were people that were in leadership positions and were supposed to be in subjection and submission. And they would consult the Urim and the Thummim, and it's like, okay, what in where they would get into trouble is when they went and consult. I was just thinking recently, yeah. I was looking at Joshua and the Gibeonites, where they just, you know, welcome him in with open arms pretty much, and they never seek God's counsel. Big problem. And, and that's that's a big problem. So so you're you're bringing up submission, and let's go ahead and read the next, the, the passage, because I, I wanted to look at <clears throat> headship, and, and obviously it goes hand in hand, that submission is a problem when they when they don't respect the headship and so it's it's yes it, you, you're you're there's more than one way to skin a cat if there's headship mentioned and that's exactly what's in the passage as you read at the beginning right. then there is also in there submission and subjection you can't have the one right. without having the other so verse 24 therefore just as the church is subject to Christ so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so I guess my point is in looking at marriages, that when marriages are not what they should be, that sometimes you have a lack of subjection, and and that may be because you have a lack of leadership. Yeah. That mm-hmm. if if the male acquiesces, his role, if he's not leading like he should be, and frankly, if he just he doesn't have much of a backbone, and, and y'all have seen it, and, and those of you who are listening, you, you know, you look you look in a lot of churches, and you know, the church here it's it's not, you know, it's like a lot of congregations where there are a lot of women, and it's like where are their husbands at, and, and I feel like a lot of times it's like oh well, and, and it's like a lot in a lot of a lot of circumstances, the wives are the spiritual backbone of the family. It's like that's not how it should be. I'm glad. I'm glad for wives who have a spiritual backbone. Sure. <laughs> and so I'm glad of that. My problem is the husbands. Yeah. And it's like, are you leading the family like you need to? Are you leading the family like Christ leads His church? Because Christ does not leave His church to their own devices. Like no, he leads the church. He's the head of the church, and and you have that idea of headship, you know. And for some reason, I keep in my mind, I keep having a picture of was it was it Harry Truman's desk where he has the the little placard. Yeah. The buck stops here. The buck stops here, yeah. and, and it was a recognition of I I am. This is my role. I am the the commander in chief, yeah. and it it stops here. Now again, even Christ has a head. That's not to say that he didn't have advisors sure. or someone that he Hus- talked to. From the very first Adam, it's like, it's not good that man yeah. should be alone. I will make him a, a helper comparable to him, a help me. Exactly. But but there's going to you're going to get down to it finally that somebody's got to make the call. Yeah. And God has told us who ought to make the call. Yeah. And we don't go on a, on a vote. It's not a democracy. Um, theocracy. Uh, monoc- mon- That's a lot of monarchy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was never all that these, good at school. Others, <laughs> yeah, and there's another one that escapes me. You know, but, but uh, another good uh, word for that, a big word. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but I think that's in all of them. You know, that's how it is. And uh, I mean, I worked in a factory and shift work, and we had a foreman. Yeah. And when it come right down to it, finally, you know, I mean, you could you could uh, do this or that, make a few adjustments, one thing or another. So the foreman came along. If he didn't want it that way, you were supposed to do it that way. He had the last call on that. And if it was if he made the wrong call, he's responsible in the in the family. If the husband makes the wrong call or the right call, he's he's responsible. He's accountable. Yeah. When the Lord when Adam and Eve sinned and the Lord comes looking for answers. He doesn't talk to Eve first. He talks to Adam first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. And it's like, fella, you're <laughs> you're the head. When you look at things within the church, Jesus purchased the church. He gave his life for the church. He told Peter, "What I'm going to give you?" He said, "I'm going to build my church." What do you say to Peter? "I'm going to give you the keys." Right. Uh, you're going to be, you know, it's my church. You're going to open the doors, but still my church. Yeah. You know, we look at that relationship of. You know the the relationship of, of, of the bride in this case. Peter's opening the doors, but he is still in subjection to what Jesus has said. He's still trying to teach what Jesus had taught. 
He's been able to continue to teach those things and not contradict himself according to God's will and being able to do those different things. And as we look at that relationship to Christ and the church, he's given himself for the church. Uh, and then we are to be able to give that honor and respect in doing what the doing what God's will is and doing what uh, the church is to be uh, and being able to follow in those principles with everything and being in subjection and showing that submission. It's not an easy task in our world today as you both were talking about with the relationship of husband and wife, whether you were talking about the, uh, you know, with the husband not doing, uh, doing their responsibility, kind of shirking it or in not leading in the proper way. And let's pause right there for a second. Cause I'll, I'll tell you what I'm, what I'm really visualizing is husbands who do not lead their wives because, well, they just don't want to make waves. It's like, well, mm. if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So I'm just going to let my wife do what she wants to do and let my family do what, whatever she wants to do because I don't want to upset my wife. And all of a sudden they acquiesce their headship. They're, is that even the right word, acquiesce? That sounds yeah, like a that's fancy right word. word yeah. Abdicate, give up. Here, I'll just use give up. <laughs> they, they don't lead like they should because they don't want to make waves. And it's like, that's not Jesus. No. Jesus is like, he leads his church. Yes, yeah, as, yeah. as we looked at in the previous lesson, Jesus being the good shepherd. Yeah. We were talking about, you know, being able to lead, whether it was encouraging or rebuking. Right. You know, there were there was a combination of everything. There are going to be times in our relationship whether it is we got we got we can exhort or we got to rebuke. Right. As as do as leadership as we can. And as the bride of Christ, you know, there's times where you got Jesus, your church, the church got to be in subjection to me. It's not easy. It, you know, we see so many times, how many times have we seen it in this world, whether we could say, or we point out, oh, it's so easy to point out in the dom domination. How about within our, sure. within the Lord's church, how many times do people not want to follow God's will? They want to establish their own will of things, kind of getting away and not leading and doing what you guys were talking about, dictatorship, or as I like to call it, the micromanager of everything and not really leading in a proper way and being able to, you know, you were going to micromanage and that's not showing subjection. It's just kind of like, you're going to obey me. And that's the end of it. Uh, leadership always seems to me huh, to indicate someone who's out in front leading, not back in the, not back in the back or, it, or just over here somewhere, something like that. It's somebody that's leading. Obviously you can point out again, there's like Moses, then there's Joshua, then there's the judges, there's the prophets, and you get to the New Testament, and then there's uh, Christ and the apostles. And the apostles didn't go out on their own and do something different from what Christ said. No, they went right along with everything that he said because that's what he told them to do. And uh, they were under authority themselves, but they were leaders. The apostle Paul yeah. and Peter and all of them though they may, might be sometimes men with feet of clay, but they were still leaders. And we just, I'm, I'm like you. I think a lot of times in church families, you just don't see the leadership from the male, adult right. male part of families. It's, you just don't see it. It's not easy. When everything's going along fine, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Sure. It, yeah. It's when, just to put it bluntly, when the church is not doing what it should be doing so and you get up into revelation and you have you know those churches it's like it's not easy for the head the lord to say you need to repent <laughs> you need to repent it, it is no it is just as difficult for husbands to go to their wives and say it's not right it's not right you, you need to and that's what the lord does with his church and that's what husbands need to do with their wives. And wives are able to speak to their husbands because we're one body. But but the idea of, of recognizing God, recognizing Jesus, and recognizing the, these things, and it's, when, like I said, when everything's roses and rainbows, it's easy. But everything's not always roses and rainbows. Yeah. And it's not in the church. And I, I'm thankful that Jesus, as the head of the church, doesn't just say, well, that's okay. I don't want to make waves. <laughs> It's like, mm. no, he wants the church to be, and this is this is going to be one of our next points, holy. And so we have headship, we have submission. And as, you know, the verse, the verse we read, just as the church is subject to Christ. So I think one of the things we have to ask is, how does, how does Jesus lead the church? And I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. It's the Bible. 
I mean, earlier in Ephesians chapter 5, where you have, let's see, verse verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, as redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And there's, there's a recognition of the headship of Jesus. Okay, how does Jesus lead? The Word. And I mean... <laughs> I won't ask for feel free to feel free to give any examples where in in churches where you have people it's like, well, why do you do this? Well, we do this because this is how we've always done it. And it's like, well that's last time I talked about that, you got me in trouble when I talk about the ham. <laughs> <laughs> the ham. I'll I'll give another example. I I knew a fella down in Texas and you you have the Lord's Supper and you have the bread and the the fruit of the vine, and he would come in every Sunday and swap sides, huh. just to see who would who would fuss. <laughs> it's like, and, and sure enough, there were people who would fuss, and they would be like, you know, the bread is supposed to go on the left, right? You know, and it's where where do you get that? It, well, that's just how we've always done it. That's yeah. just how we've we, always done it. We always that, claim, we always, you know, we're trying to show book, chapter, verse with everything. It's not a matter of our tradition. There are some things that we could do for tradition, sure. but it's not binding. You know, but that's where so that's where we that's where we get ourselves. Are you trying problems. to say Sunday night meeting time? The scriptural time is six o'clock, well, right? The scriptural that's... gospel meeting time is seven thirty <laughs> up here. Uh, okay. That's sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> I got I got myself into trouble with that because when I moved up there to Norwalk, the first the first gospel we had said, "Why aren't we meeting that scriptural time at seven thirty? Yeah. And some somebody didn't notice my sarcasm there. But anyway, it's we look at these things sometimes. You know, those binding things. There are things that are bound, and we look at the scriptures. The scriptures kind of give us the answer for how to know and do God's will, how to show subjection, how to be holy to God and holy uh, through uh, compared to the world. But sometimes we want to use those traditions. Kind of being like we read about with the Pharisees and binding those. Okay. And what are we doing? We're rejecting God's will yeah. to keep those traditions. And there's where we see the big issue is where we put God's will now becomes a lower standard of things. Right. And my tradition or my own will is being uh, higher up the scale. You, you know, y'all struggles with it. Y- y'all are probably the same way as I am. You know, if you go into a meeting with someone, you know, meeting with elders, business meeting, whatever. I've always got my Bible with me. I've always got my Bible. Good idea. And it's like, and people are like, well, why are you carrying your Bible? And it's like, because this is how the questions get answered. The, this is how the Lord leads. Yeah. <laughs> and, and people forget that. And they're, you know, they get distracted by other stuff. It's like, that's what the devil wants us to do. Because yeah. the devil doesn't want the Lord to lead. That if we are going to be in, in submission to Jesus as the head of the church... Well, it's like, okay, well, how does he lead? It's through the word. It's his will. And, you know, the more, do, do y'all think it's it's fair to say the, the more we study the Bible, the more we read and study and meditate, every question's answered pretty much. <laughs> it, you know, there's just, there's just a myriad of examples. And people think, huh, I, I've never thought about applying that, that passage to this. It's like, well, there it is. And you just go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you rightly divide it. And it's like, wow, there's there's examples for all of these things. It might not always be in as minute a detail as we would like it, but it's all the detail that we need. Yeah. So yeah. we've got all that we need. And, and to say that, well, if if we need something and it's not there, yeah. Well then, that's probably the Lord's way of saying you really don't need that. Yeah, <laughs> you, don't prob- need to, you don't need to. You don't need to focus on that. And probably at an early age, we all learn that wanting something and needing something are two different things. Yeah, I remember telling my dad one time I wanted this grindstone that he was sharpening a hatchet on, and I told him I want that. No, I told him I need that. I didn't need that. What would a four-year-old boy need with a grindstone? No, I wanted it. Yeah. Big difference. Sorry, Terry got a phone call there momentarily. That's all right. Terry, I'll, my phone was going <laughs> off. I'll, I'll give you an, I'll, I'll give you a fine example. This past Wednesday, Terry, during class, someone's phone starts going off. Like and that. It, and it's just playing music. And for those of you, you know, if, if you're from North Ridgeville and you're listening to this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
it goes on for two or three minutes, and it's coming from my left side where my family sits, and I thought maybe it was my son's phone, and they're not turning it off. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm just trying to tune it out and ignore it. And after about four or five minutes, eventually I can't, and I said, someone's phone's going off. And my daughter says, I think it's yours. <laughs> and it was in my and it was in my pocket and it accidentally opened up the music app. Oh. And so the moral of the story is, and I'm pretty sure there's biblical examples of this, be careful when you're blaming someone else that uh-huh. it may be your own issue. Maybe. That's right. And as they say down south, before worrying about your neighbor's house, you might try sweeping off your own porch. Yeah. And I believe that's don't look at the the speck in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own. Uh, so anyway, uh, have, <laughs> ha- it, have it, it happened buddy. to me a couple of weeks ago too. Have it happens yeah. to oh, yeah. from time to well, time. Well, I record on on FaceTime live at Piggott and at uh, Oak Grove. And uh, one day I said, Syria. <laughs> well, be careful. It's going to activate And the again. phone thought I said, Siri, and there it went. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just sitting there staring at it and thinking, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here it goes. We're yeah. To... <laughs> yeah. Suddenly got switched to the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So back to our topic. We've spoken about headship. We're talking about submission, letting Christ lead, how that happens. And, and then we have holiness, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You know, the idea of of holiness, and we see in, in my notes I put down glorification, and what I mean by that is this brings glory to the Lord, and that right. while we may think about oh, any glory the Lord bestows upon us, ultimately, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. And that you have this concept as, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. The the verse I was thinking of also, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And it's like, this is the best thing. The best thing, the reason the Lord's doing all this is that this is, how he is glorified and how his father are glorified. But this concept of holiness, you know, I always like to use the example of the rich young ruler. Rich young ruler comes to Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the law, (laughs) and starts quoting the passages. And what's the rich young ruler say? Kept those back all since all my youth. I've I've been doing those for a long time. Right. And Jesus says, well, if you want to be complete, Sell what you have, give to the poor. Come, follow me. And I, th- I think in one of the accounts, Jesus Jesus actually says one thing you lack. Yes. Yes. And I <laughs> I think most people right there would say, you're good. <laughs> you, you know, we'll let that one slide. <laughs> and most people aren't interested in holiness. They're interested in just relative goodness. But, you know, if there if there's just one thing... People usually say, ah, 99, you know, we'll be happy with the 99 sheep. Hmm. And they're not interested in in actual holiness. And that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's inspired by God that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And the devil, you know, we were talking earlier this morning, Terry, and you mentioned the passage about, what is it? Do not do not give place to the devil. Yeah. That's in Ephesians four. Yeah. Nearby. You would think I should, you know, over there it's it's on the left side of the page. It's four twenty seven. <laughs> Ephesians four twenty seven. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Yeah. You know, given that foothold. And the point is do you feel like sometimes people are content to let to let things slide? And, and to overlook, to overlook that one thing, and then it's like that's what the devil is looking for. He wants you to overlook that one thing because that's the foothold he needs. Water always takes the path yeah. of least resistance, and it's far too many times that we do the same thing. I think people do it. I think sometimes preachers do it. I think sometimes 
that elders do it. I think sometimes churches do this, but I don't think the Lord ever did. I don't think he chose the path of least resistance. Whatever it was, he was right there and he met it. Now, if we're taking the path of least resistance, we need to stop for just a minute and realize, look where you're at and and where you're going and stop this and and go back here. I think it's uh, the letter to the Ephesians in uh, the Ephesian church in uh, Revelation 2. You know, he tells them to repent and return and do your first works. Right, yeah. All right. So if they're off the mark, and he says they're off the mark, that's what you need to do. And it sounds like, okay, there we go. That wouldn't be too hard to do, really. Why isn't everybody doing that then? Yeah. And why is everybody resistant to it? Are we talking about submission again? Right. And maybe they're not submission. Maybe there's not the right kind of leadership. Maybe there is too much of this. Oh, just go ahead. It's okay. You're okay. I'm okay. There's so many things, and we need to get get away from all this. And get down here. It's not It's not hard to understand how to be a Christian and how to live like a Christian. It's hard to some folks to just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. I, I uh, don't, Ephesians, go ahead. Uh, Ephesians 4. You know, you weren't mentioned Ephesians. Well, Ephesians 4, 17 through 24 talks about the change that we're to make. What does he say there in verse 22? You put off your former conduct. That means the former self, the way we were living is not okay. The sinful ways. And so, again, as you both were pointing out, the idea of uh, being able to be complacent or be able to kind of overlook some of the different faults that we have and just kind of say, well, that's okay. Well, no, we have to, it's it's not a matter of just trying to put someone into shame. As we were talking just recently, we're you know trying to show that godly sorrow leads to repentance as well. We're to put away the former conduct of ourselves. To be holy means that we are to be set apart. We are to be different. And God has given us his word on how, the instruction on how we can be different and not give in to those old, deceitful, former, lustful types of conduct and ways of living. You know, I I think to look in, in Ephesians 5 and 6 and 4 and the whole letter, you know, you have this walking in love, walking in light, walking in wisdom. And then he gets into the application. Because, I mean, it's one thing to talk about it. It's like, okay, you have to actually apply it in families. So now we're talking about marriage. The next passage is children and parents. It's like you have to apply it in families. And it's fathers and mothers and children. The next passage is talking about bond servants and masters. It's like you have to apply it at work. Right. And then the next passage is the whole armor of God. Namely, you better you better suit up in every moment of life. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the devil's looking for that place. He, he's looking for us to be unholy. The devil does not want us to be holy. He doesn't want us to be complete. He's looking for a foothold. And if it's there in marriage, he'll take it. If it's with our children, he'll take it. If it's at work, he'll take it. If it's anywhere, he'll take it. If it's in the church, wherever it's at. The devil's looking for that place. That verse that you, or, or the the idea that you mentioned, Terry, about the water reminded me of, and it's Proverbs seventeen fourteen. The beginning of strife is like releasing water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Just the idea of before it begins, mm-hmm. it's like you got cracks in the dam. You got problems. <laughs> you, you got problems. You know the devil. It says walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and for some reason. There's folks that have never either thought about it or seen a documentary or anything about lion. If a lion's out here stalking a herd, it's not a full frontal attack every second that he's around that herd. He's over here waiting and he's subtle and he's watching everything to find out someone in that herd, an animal in that herd, and then he attacks He's waiting for the moment. And that's how it is with us. He's not going to come at us all the time with a frontal attack, but he's going to wait until, well, what's the old thing about here you are and you got the armor of God and you're resisting the wiles of the devil and you're doing good. And is he coming at you with everything he's got right then and there? Maybe, maybe not. But I guarantee you this, when you turn your back and start heading for the campfire, here he comes. 
when you're exposed, right? When you're unable to protect yourself, when and we, all, when we were kids, most vulnerable. Here he comes. When we were when we were kids, Buster, oh. <laughs> Buster would sit there. Now he attacked anybody, but he would attack me and my sister and get us on the back of the right there on the back of the of the like the Achilles and sit there and attack. But he wouldn't do it all the time. No, he would wait until he knew that we were just kind of we were just like going to bed or something, and we wouldn't turn around to look. And Very that's cool. when he'd sit there and come from behind and nail us. Yeah. It's a similar tactic. Sure. A similar mentality of how Satan's trying to get at us and yeah. trying to wait for that moment. Find that moment where they can be able to sneak in and get just one claw a hold uh, you know, on you, touch you in some sort of way to try to bring you down and weaken you for that moment to make an attack even better. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea of, of holiness... And and there is an element to be holy as God is holy. Yeah. And if we will if we will fight against the wiles of the devil, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And as as the Lord dealt with the devil's temptations, at a certain point the devil departed. <clears throat> now he departed for a more opportune time, <laughs> but he did depart. Yes. And the angels came and I believe it says the angels came and strengthened him, talking about Jesus. Yeah. But, you know, here in Ephesians 5, as it talks about, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For you know this, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. If anybody thinks... It's not a big deal. Whenever someone says it's not a big deal, that's usually when it's a big it's deal. It's a big deal, yeah. And the devil knows what he's doing. And so we're called to holiness. This idea of that he might, that Jesus sanctifies and cleanses her, his bride, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And you have this picture of, of the marriage ceremony and I don't know about y'all, but you know when we when we talk about weddings, and I understand there there is an element of tradition here, but there's also a biblical element of the wedding garment, and and culturally speaking, you know we have the white dress. The white dress doesn't mean any more any more. It was meant to mean purity. Do people care about purity anymore? Mm, no. Good grief! You you see what some people wear as a wedding dress. And it's like there, there's no care about virtue and purity and chastity and all of those things. And, and as you have this picture of the bride, right, being prepared for the groom. And we're going through life and we are what's supposed to be happening is we are we're being transformed day by day by the renewing of our mind. And sometimes people forget that. And all of a sudden it's, you know, what's a little uncleanness here? What's a little lasciviousness here? What's a little lewdness here and there? What's the big deal? It's a big deal. We're, we're preparing to meet Jesus. And when Jesus comes back, you know, you mentioned the church in Ephesus and Revelation and, and all those other congregations. And he says, repent. He says, repent. Because... Oh, what is it? Is it first or second Peter where it talks about after the the dissolving of these things? And he says, therefore, because of this, what manner of persons ought we to be in conduct? And it's like, we don't want to be found by the Lord wanting. And we're thankful for his grace, but we better be. Second Peter 3, 11. Thank you. We better be. um, And thankful, as, as I said, by his grace. Better be striving to walk that straight and narrow path. <laughs> yeah. You because know, it, if, if we look like the world, if we act like the world, if we're acting worldly, then we're acting carnally yeah. and we're not pleasing to the Lord. Years, so, years ago, I heard a, a quote. I really liked it. It came from a very famous and successful college basketball coach. And he said, Bobby Knight. Oh, no. How'd sorry. you guess? Was it Bobby Knight? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I wasn't going to say his name, but you give it away. Anyway, 
He said that uh, everybody wants to win, but not everybody is willing to prepare to win. And I thought that's it right there. That's it. That whatever the sport is, that's it. But then again, me being the, the way my head work, mind works sometime, I thought to myself, bingo, everybody wants to go to heaven, but not everybody's willing to prepare to go to heaven, which is what we're talking about. Right. Holiness, preparing to go to heaven, For the- sanctification, all those things, preparing to go. Not everybody's willing to do that, but the ones who are willing to do that, they will go to heaven. They will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Always the remnant. Ephesians 5, verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them, for it's shameful even to speak of those things. Holiness. Got to do it. <laughs> Got, we, we, that's what we're called to. Yes. So headship, submission, holiness. And then I thought we might, the last point I wanted to make quickly was unity. We are members of his body. This is Ephesians 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And that while, yes, Christ does, he is the head of the church, we are working together. And that he works with his bride, and his bride works with him, and we are one flesh. You look at the relationship of husband and wife. I know it's mentioned there in verse 31. The two leave their father and mother. The two become one. Yeah. You know, we see that they're, they're no longer two entities. They're one together and one joining. And that's from Genesis 2 the very, from the very beginning. Yeah. And so there's that understanding of that relationship from the very beginning. And now, again, Paul says, I'm not speaking about, I, I want to speak right. on Christ and the church. Here it is. Christ you know, is working as the head. We are the body working together in this manner of being one together. I've always thought that was interesting that that, like you said, that quote is from Genesis. Was it Genesis two? Genesis two, 21 and 24. Well, it's not exactly like Adam had a mother. Right. And yet there it is. So it's kind of odd in that respect, but I think we could say the same thing about Jesus and that while, you know, as we think about him, yes, we understand Mary but this concept, it's like Jesus is the son of God. He's immortal. Before Abraham was, I am. Yeah. And yet you have the same idea being applied to him and that he's joining himself to his bride. Right. And the two are, are one body and working together. Terry, we were talking about something else and we won't <laughs> don't have time to, to get into it, but you made the point of I'm not working for, I'm working with. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and that while I think you'd say the same thing here. Oh, we're we're working. You know, does a wife work for her husband? Does the bride work for her head? Yeah. No, the bride works with with. And yes, there's a respect of of headship, a respect of authority, but ultimately, it's like we're one body, the bride and, and the bridegroom. And in that relationship, or in relationships in the church, relationships with God. When you lose sight of that working with, there's just nothing ahead but trouble. Yeah. In a marriage, in a church. That's when it does start becoming a, it's just a job. Yeah. And it's just, it's just a job. And people become, I think people sometimes, you know, since we're talking about, you know, uh, the church, I think sometimes in churches, people get too involved in having the final say and the power and other things along that line and just lose sight of the unity. Yeah. I'm going to be right. And I don't care what anybody else thinks. Yeah. And apparently they don't care what the Lord thinks either. <laughs> Cause that's the one that ultimately counts. Yeah. That's when it counts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Daniel, you wanted to close us out in revelation, right? Yeah. Revelation 22 verse 17. And I use this in my sermon Sunday morning. It says the spirit and the bride say, come, let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Again, we see the invite. We see the the Spirit. You know, we talk about if we talk about God, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see the Spirit and the bride. They're both in unison offering yeah. an invitation. They're saying, come. And then he goes on to say, well, let him who hears this. Yeah. They say, come. Again, speaking about 
us as individuals, as a church, but we're to be able to invite others to be part of this, to be one together with God. I've heard people say before when offering the invitation, it's not our invitation, it's the Lord's invitation. Mm. From that verse, it's like it's our invitation too. Yeah, it's everyone. The Spirit says come, if we're and, following the, God, and the bride says come. If we're following God, then we're following what He has said also. So yeah. we again see there's a need for an invitation, and here it is all laid out for us in this harmony of everything. Come. And yeah. who's it we're coming to? We're coming to God. We're coming to Jesus. We're coming to obey His will, to know Him, to be one with Him. Respecting His authority. His authority. Submitting to mm-hmm. Him. Recognizing this is for his, we're glorifying him. Yeah. And yet he nourishes and he cherishes us. And we just are thankful to be a part of him, of his body. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and close out with that thought. Appreciate, appreciate Daniel. I guess I appreciate you, even though you always talk about <laughs> amusement parks and things like that. But Terry, it's good having you on the, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been good having you on. Appreciate thank you. you coming on and thank and you for stu- the invitation. You. Appreciate you studying along with us, Daniel. It it has been good to study with you too. Absolutely, same here. And, and we we thank everyone for tuning in and for following along. Thank you for for looking to Jesus. Yes, Daniel, you have your finger. I'm just up. going to just one more. I'm going to offer the invitation. I'm probably going to gospel do it every, meeting every, coming gospel up. Gospel meeting. October 8th through the 11th. We stopped there, recording five seconds. 386 no, North Edgewood <laughs> Drive, Norwalk, Ohio. Keith Welch, he was a member there with us there yeah. at Norwalk at one point. He preaches over in Barberton, just outside of Akron, Ohio. When's it start? October 8th October through the 8th. 11th. Normal times on Sunday, and then Monday through Wednesday, we're meeting at that scriptural time for gospel meetings at 730. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, everyone, for listening, for tuning in, for sharing. Uh, thankful for the good comments. And like I said, if you have anything that you would like for us to study, feel free to let either Daniel or myself know, and we would be we'd be glad to study it on the program. Appreciate you as we all look to Jesus, the Author and the Finisher of the faith. Hope you're doing well. Join us next week for another episode. Thank you. Thank you.